this time the traveling lecturer uh, who is coming from the Montana to give us a lecture. So I, I want to apologize for the short notice room change, but it was a good decision as I see. So Solid State is a small room. And here I would like to thank uh, Optical Society of America for the opportunity to, uh, to, to give this lecture and also to the Joab Schechner uh, who helped to organize this. And of course to our guest who is uh, John Joseph Shaw, who coming from the Montana to give us a lecture. And Joseph uh, made his, uh, his born in the Alaska, if I write, and he did his PhD in the University of Arizona in Optical Science. And now he is the professor in the Montana State University who is working in the field of atmospheric optics and depolarization. And today he will give us a lecture in the optics and nature. So, You're welcome. Thank you. figure it out. Thank you, Pavel, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks to Joav Schechner for helping to organize and host me. And we'll figure this out eventually, I guess. <laughs> it's an optic. It's kind of an electrical problem, too, at this point. <laughs> I'm just delighted to see so many people here. This is great. I know it's kind of hot for you and uncomfortable to to be the people in the back or whatever, but, but we're glad you're here. That's looking good, good. So the way I'd like to do this is pretty informally. If you have questions, you can certainly ask them at the end. But you also can ask them as we go along, because sometimes you forget what your question is, or I don't know where you're asking about, so just feel free to shout out or ask a question, raise your hand, whatever, and I'll try to answer them. There will be questions, I'm sure, that I won't know the answer to, but I will do my best. So with that, we will go. Yesterday I spoke a little bit about some of the research that I'm doing that's related to some of this work, but today is really just, the focus of today's talk is just on <coughs> the appreciation and this, you know, the science, a little, bit of basic science explanation of all the different types of th phenomena that we can see optically in the atmosphere around us, at least mostly in the atmosphere. And so very, <coughs> at, at the fundamental basis of so much of what we talk about is atmospheric optical scattering. If we want to talk about scattering, we need to divide or we, we don't need to, but usually we divide this discussion into two different types of scattering. Quite frequently, we will refer to Rayleigh scattering, which is valid for particles that are much, much smaller than the wavelength being considered. So for visible light, of course, with wavelengths on the order of half a micron, then this would be relevant to particles that are, that are maybe, you know, submicron particles. Certainly, the molecules of gas that make up the atmosphere itself constitute Rayleigh particles. Me scattering is strictly uh, relevant only to spherical scattering objects, but generally we will talk about me scattering as being for larger particles that might be on the order of, of the wavelength or even larger than the, than the wavelength. And just those two simple concepts right there can explain essentially everything we see in this image, and we'll, we'll be talking about the different pieces as we go. So here's some calculations, just some plots that show the, uh, the normalized irradiance, so basically how bright the light is normalized to its maximum as a function of wavelength across the visible spectrum. And this is, these are just calculations made using a me scattering code. And so what I did is I put a one nanometer particle in here to simulate, you know, Rayleigh scattering. And then I put a 10 micron particle here to, to give just one example of a me scattering kind of object. 
depending on what the optical properties are of the particles, depending on the size of the particles, the wavelength dependence of the scattering can vary quite drastically. But generally speaking, this plot shows two things that we need to keep in our mind. And that is that for small particles, the scattering tends to be maximum at shorter wavelengths. And of course, the Rayleigh scattering law is the famous one over wavelength to the fourth behavior, so that that enhances the blue light significantly over the red light. And we are quite frequently d told that that explains why the sky is blue, but it doesn't quite. We'll revisit that in just a minute. Whereas the larger particles, in this case, this particular po particle is showing uh, even a slight increase with wavelength, but that's not the point. The point is, is that it's either flat with wavelength or maybe even falling off with wavelength, but not as steeply as with the Rayleigh particles. So as we increase the content of larger particles in the atmosphere, we will start to see a decrease of Rayleigh type of behavior. In other words, we will go from having a nice deep blue color that we perceive by eye to having something else, and it might even be white or gray. So here's a good example. I took this picture through my car windshield when I should have been being more careful and driving, but instead I was driving with one hand and taking a picture with the other hand, and shh, don't tell anybody, but I do those things. This is driving down the freeway going into Los Angeles, and you know, famous place with lots of particles in the air, lots of haze, and so we have pretty much a white sky. And that's because the large particle content is high. And so there's no Rayleigh scattering that we can observe here. It's all, it's all me scattering with, with fairly white colors. Here's a picture in Montana, which is the opposite of Los Angeles, very clean air usually. And so now we have a nice rich blue color. Uh, we have a cloud that's white. And, and in fact, the reason that clouds appear nominally white to us is exactly what we're talking about right now that the particles here are the molecules of gas that make up the atmosphere. So primarily nitrogen and oxygen gas is the bulk of our atmosphere. Those molecules scatter this light with this one over wavelength to the fourth power. And so what does that predict? Well, that, yes, that predicts that blue will be scattered much more than red. So it makes sense that the sky would be blue, not red. But if you ask yourself, well, what about the other wavelengths? There's violet is on the other side of blue. Now we can understand why the sky would not be ultraviolet because then the absorption becomes very high. But what about violet? Why don't we see a violet sky instead of, instead of a blue sky? Do you know the answer to that? Okay, absorption is part of it, but it's not sufficient to completely explain it. Somebody said it over here. Yeah, yeah. The, if you multiply the one over wavelength to the fourth curve by the human eye response, the human visual system response, it brings it down, right? The human visual response cuts off down at around 380 or 400 nanometers. And when, when you combine those two parameters, then you, you find that the color of the sky tends to be a, a sort of a middle blue, pastel blue color, just like what we see here. So all of those pieces do play a role, but it's the eye sensitivity. And so because of that, cameras like the one he's using there, I can point at him while he takes my picture. <laughs> His camera and my camera have filters in them that, that tailor the response because the detectors, whether it's CMOS or CCD or whatever, it's generally silicon. Those silicon detectors will respond from fairly, you know, certainly at least 400 nanometers out to a full a thousand nanometers or so, right, a micron or so. And so typically there's a filter there to taper off the edges of the response of the camera in the visible, or sorry, out on the short wave end and, and the long wave end. Otherwise the camera would see something different than what we see. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about what makes the sky different colors, but now we can also explain <coughs> colors that we see in something like a sunset when we think about scattering. 
and I'm not showing actually sunset pictures. I'm going to show moonset pictures, but that's all right. It's the same basic idea. What is moonlight? It's just reflected sunlight, right? At least in the visible spectrum. We just have sunlight that's striking the moon and reflecting. So here's a picture of the full moon high in the sky. Here's a picture of the full moon down on the horizon, or almost full moon, sitting on the horizon. I took this picture just near where I live, and you can see the trees. And the color is, it's gone from a very clear grayish white to kind of a yellow kind of color. And the reason is that as, as the moon or the sun be, goes low on the horizon, the path length through the atmosphere for the light from that source, the path length becomes very long. Now, the distance to the moon isn't changing, just the, dis, the amount of that path that goes through the atmosphere is changing. So you can imagine it in one extreme when the sun or the moon, if it were to be straight overhead, then we would have one atmospheric path length. And in fact, we, we call that, in atmospheric science, we call that one air mass. And then when you go down at stronger angles, you get, you get a longer path length, <coughs> approximately going as, as one over the cosine of the zenith angle. So when you get down right on the horizon, that, that factor approaches infinity. So the path length, if it was a plain parallel atmosphere, that path length would approach infinity. But it, it becomes long. And so in that long path, there's scattering that, go, that goes on. And so that scattering is producing blue light in the sky so that somebody over here can see a blue sky. But somebody over here that's looking at the sunset or at the moon set, or this is actually a moon rise, sees what's left over after the blue is scattered out. Well, if we have weak scattering, then what you see is kind of a yellow color. If you have strong scattering, because there's more particulate matter in the, in the air, then you can turn the moon into, or the sun, into a very red color. Now, I cheated a little bit. I don't have to, because I've got lots of pictures of, of smoky, hazy sunsets and sunrises. But this, this particular picture is actually a picture that I took during a, a solar eclipse, or a lunar eclipse. And during the eclipse, the, the moon becomes very, very red. But the same idea applies. As I landed just the other day at Tel Aviv Airport, the, the sun was just getting low on the horizon. And I have a picture that I took. Maybe I should have put it in this presentation. But of a nice red sun setting down over the Mediterranean looks very similar. OK, so now I want to draw your attention to a very interesting extension of all these ideas which is illustrated partly here. This is a picture at the north end of Yellowstone National Park. Most people have probably heard of Yellowstone, and some people have probably visited Yellowstone. This is just about one hour south of my place where I live. And these mountains are the mountains that are between my house and Yellowstone Park. So, so I live on the other side of that mountain. <coughs> what do we see? We see blue from Rayleigh scattering, and we see white from me scattering nominally. And this is a nice daylight picture. The sun is illuminating the scene, and we're looking at scattered sunlight. And then the question that I want to ask you is this. I'm going to go back up to here. If moonlight is just scattered or reflected sunlight, then how come when the moon is up at night, how come we see just darkness? In other words, the question I really want to ask is, what color is the sky at night? Well, if, it's, if you're in a city and there's lots of light pollution, the sky can be all kinds of strange colors. But, but let's get outside of the city and go somewhere dark, somewhere clear. And we look up, and what do we see under a moonlit night? We see black. We see the moon, and then we see black, just like this picture shows. The moon, and then there's black. Well. In reality, that moonlight is scattered in the same exact manner that sunlight is, but there's just a million times less light with the moon than sun. So my camera can perform a trick that my eye cannot perform. My camera, I can actually hit the shutter button and lock it open and leave it open and integrate, 
and collect light for a minute or whatever. But my eye can't do that, right? My eye is constantly reading out the signal. But if I could make my eye integrate, I would see this. So this is at night with moonlight. Same scene. And what do you see? What color is the sky? It's blue. Now, you might argue, but it's a little bit different blue. It doesn't look quite the same, does it? Well, that's just because during the exposure, these clouds are moving through the field. So the clouds are streaked. And I don't see clear picture of the clouds. But essentially, what I'm doing is I'm taking this dark, this rich blue color and mixing some white with it and making a pastel blue. Yeah, somebody leaned on the. <coughs> and then if you look closely, you can see the stars of the Big Dipper here. So that tells you that it really is, or at least it suggests that it's at night. I mean, I could have gone in there and added those with Photoshop, but I did not. So the, moon, or the, the sky is blue at night if you have moonlight. You just have to open your camera shutter for a little while to, to see that. OK, so all the colors of the what? What comes next? Rainbow. rainbow. So if we, if we want to talk about rainbows, we should start with simple geometric optics. If you, if you pretend that a water droplet, that a raindrop, is a sphere, because it's not really, but it, it's kind of a sphere. So if you just say for a moment that it's spherical, then what happens to the light that comes in to a raindrop? If we say that this black ray actually represents white light, then the light refracts here. Obviously, you get a small reflection, too. You get some reflection off of that surface. But the refracted light, the blue light refracts more than the red light because of the dispersion. Most of the light goes out the back. So I don't have rays showing that here, but most of this light goes out the back. And some of it reflects at the back surface and then refracts again here. And we get these colors that are separated in angle. So that's the primary rainbow. If I've heard some people say that this is a total internal reflection back here. If that was true, then you would look at a rainbow and you would blind yourself. Not exactly, but it would be extremely bright. That doesn't happen, does it? Rainbows can be very bright, but they're not that bright. So we lose a lot of light right here that people kind of forget about sometimes. <coughs> now, what they might be thinking is that it may not be a total internal reflection, but it is a reflection that is very near the Brewster angle. And so because of that, that reflected light is very highly polarized. And so the rainbow light is actually very highly polarized. And I think I have a picture to show you that in just a few minutes. If instead we come in at a slightly different angle, then we still have refraction and a reflection. And then we have another reflection here. And then another refraction here. This is what gives rise to the second rainbow or secondary rainbow. <laughs> and there are higher order rainbows. And there's a lot of interest in those these days. But I'm going to stop there. Because that's usually what we see. So here's a picture of a piece of the primary rainbow and a piece of the secondary rainbow. So here's the primary rainbow. And you go back to the diagram and you say, wait a minute, let's see if I can understand this. Red light, the, the thing that some people get backwards is they think, well, the red is on the bottom and the blue is on top. And then they go to the rainbow picture and they say, the blue color is on the inside and the red is on the outside. That seems backwards. But it's not backwards because, of course, what you have to remember is it's the angle of these rays that matters. The red ray is coming in at an angle such that the red light is going to appear to be coming from above where the blue light is coming from. So it's not where the light ray is. It's where the light ray is coming from. So we get the order being blue on the inside and red on the outside. So if you have children and they're painting rainbows, don't destroy their being a child. but uh, <laughs> Gently, maybe nudge them toward having the right color order. You can always say it's a secondary rainbow, what they're doing. Right? That's right. Unless they have blue in the middle or something. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly right. The secondary rainbow has the opposite color order, and it's because of this extra reflection here. So it's literally the mirror image of the primary rainbow. And it's also weaker than the primary <laughs> rainbow because we lose a lot of light at each reflection. There's a question here. Uh, 
Yeah, so the question was, if we had a non-spherical droplet, could you get a total internal reflection? And, and absolutely, you could. Um, the reason that I was saying that they're not spherical is because raindrops are usually more like little oblate uh, pillow, pillow shaped spheroidal objects. And so they fall with their long axis sideways just because of aerodynamic forces. And uh, there actually are some papers where people have looked at some brightening effects because of the shapes of, of water droplets. So yeah, you're on to a very good idea there. Other questions before we go on? Please. The, the inside of the uh, rainbow is lighter than the wide depth. Good observation. So you're asking why this is much brighter here than here. Th you can think about it, I guess the way that I like to say it is that all of this light that creates the rainbow has to come from somewhere. And it's basically these are angles from which the light is taken to create the light here. And so this is a minimum deviation problem. So if you look at tracing rays at multiple angles, you'll see that there's a concentration of rays that create the rainbow. And then there's another spread of rays that come out this way into this region and create this bright area. But none of those rays uh, appear to be coming from that region. So this is actually given a name. It's called Alexander's dark band. And the dark band between the primary and secondary rainbow can sometimes appear very dark compared to everything else. So yeah, great observation. OK, when we look at the, if you take the index of refraction of water and look at how the refraction works, you will find that there's typically something like 42 degrees approximately for the first order rainbow and 51 degrees for the second or, secondary rainbow. But remember, these are angles measured from the incoming rays. And what I'm going to show you next and talk about when I refer to angles in the most of the rest of the discussion, I will be talking about what's called a scattering angle. And the scattering angle is the angle of the ray relative to the direction that we were originally going. In other words, this angle here instead of this angle up here. So 180 degrees minus 42. So that would be 138 degrees is where we expect the primary rainbow to be. This is a plot from a Mie scattering code showing the brightness on a logarithmic scale because there's such a wide range of brightness. And then scattering angle in degrees from 0 on the left to 180 degrees on the right. So that 42 degrees that we were just looking at for the primary rainbow, and of course that's color dependent, but approximately 42 <laughs> degrees corresponds to 138 degrees on this scale. So that would be right about here. And sure enough, that's where we see this peak, which we recognize as the primary rainbow. So I guess the first message that I'm trying to tell you is you don't need geometric optics. Geometric optics is great because it allows you to do a very simple explanation of the rainbow. But all the, all the details of the rainbow are pretty much captured here in Mie scattering as well. So what I've done is taken a half a millimeter uh, radius droplets, put a little spread around it. If you don't have a spread in radius, then you get really sharp features that oscillate. And those tend to be washed out with a spread of sizes of droplets. But nevertheless, those features do tend to be there. And so we'll look for those in some pictures in just a moment. So I, I'm going to repeat this graph a couple times as we go through the talk just to try to remind you that we did one calculation and we saw all these features and now we can go out and see, point your camera in different places in the sky and see examples of these different features. What you did here is an electromagnetic calculation, right? The yeah. Equations on, on various sizes of particles. That's right. This is a Maxwell's equation solution for spherical dr scattering from spherical water droplets. Assuming they are dielectric? This is assuming, <laughs> in, in this case, yeah, I just put in, I, I think I put in a zero absorption, but you can put in absorption as well. So yeah, it's essentially little dielectric spheres. And what the way to read this graph is that zero angle, I think I have a little, no, I don't. Zero angle corresponds to um, looking straight at the light source. So don't do that, OK? That's you taking your eyes and looking straight at the sun. 
we don't want you to look straight at the sun. We want you to block the sun and then look at the light around it. So this little peak is going to be called the corona. Then the brightness will tail off and we'll have a darkish region around 90 degrees. And then it'll come up, we'll have the secondary rainbow. Here's the dark band that you were asking me about. This is the dark region. This is the primary rainbow. And then it comes down and then right at 180 degrees, which is the backscatter direction. In other words, if the sun is over there where that clock is, then <coughs> the light would be coming from the clock, hitting a water droplet here and coming right back. 180 degrees is so I'm looking at the anti-solar point, the point opposite the sun. So this is looking at the sun, this is looking away from the sun, and this is looking 90 degrees from the sun. We see the two rainbows and we see a prediction that there are oscillations in the rainbow, which you do see from time to time. So here's a picture of a double rainbow that I took in my backyard, actually. And it's, it shows you that it's a very wide angle phenomenon. If you want to take rainbow pictures and capture the full double rainbow, you have to have a very wide angle lens. And um, I forget exactly what wide angle lens I had here, but it was very wide. I am close enough to the picture that I can see some features here that you may not be able to see, and maybe right up in here. But we have a better picture coming up. But you can see probably fairly clearly that, first of all, the, as the prediction showed, the primary rainbow is brighter. And it's also the color order is reversed. <coughs> and, and they're concentric. Now these are concentric circles. And they're centered on a point. And what is that point? Yeah, it's the shadow point. It's, the, it's, it's where the glory is. It's the anti-solar point. It's this point at 180 degrees away from the sun. So because of that, you can understand where the sun was when you see a picture of a rainbow. Because a rainbow is, I think I have a picture of that next. A rainbow is a circle, and it's centered on the anti-solar point. So if you are, let me go back to the original picture here. If you're looking at this picture and you see that the angle of the rainbow with respect to the surface is, yeah, I don't know, 70 degrees or something, that tells you that the sun is behind me at about 20 degree elevation. And as the sun sets, the rainbow rises. And so if you could get a rainbow formed after the sun was down below the horizon, then you could see part of the curvature that was below the horizon. And the only way you can really see that is because it has to be illuminated, is to get in an airplane or stand on a waterfall or something like that. So I don't, have a, I don't have the great picture that I wish I had, but this is a cool picture because it's taken over a famous place that you probably all recognize. This is Waikiki Beach, Diamond Head on the island of Oahu. So I'm on my way to the island of Hawaii to do some research, and I took this picture. What's happening is, the wind is blowing up here, and there's raindrops being blown out of those clouds up into the air around my airplane, and they're being illuminated by the sun. And so I'm getting a rainbow in the clear air, which is kind of cool. And, and you can see that it comes down below here and continues down well below the horizon, because I'm up above the horizon. Now this one, again, I hope you can make out, ignore the graph for the moment, but look, look here. Can you see these supernumerary bands? There's little extra stripes of color down below the rainbow. Some people I've had tell me that, that they've called those multiple order rainbows. They're not multiple order rainbows. What it is is interference fringes. It's when we did that scattering calculation, we saw that there's a rainbow and then there's little oscillations. You can think about it from a geometric optics perspective as different ray paths through the water drop that differ slightly in pa optical path length. And so we get little fringes on the bottom of a rainbow. Um, that's these fringes right here. And because of that rainbow's geometry with respect to the surface, you can tell that this was fairly early in the afternoon. The sun is quite high in the sky. And because of that, the rainbow is quite low on the horizon. Are you saying that the droplet is now a little resonator where you have really multiple reflections within between the walls of the, ray, of the, of the, of the drop? Um, or, or is it between drops, or what, what's going on? Yeah, you, you have to remember that what we're seeing is a phenomenon that's created by um, scattering in many, many raindrops. And so really, 
We could, we could also explain this by having a, a range of sizes, but that's not, you don't need that actually. What you're really seeing is interference from different ray paths through that drop. So you could model this and predict this with a single droplet. But we also have multiple droplets, so you could get ray paths through the, each drop could have a slightly different optical path length. If you have many, many different drop sizes, then you tend to wash this all out. They're all the same. It would look drastically different, the secondary thing, if all the droplets were, were identical. If all the drops are identical, then you tend to enhance that effect, actually. <laughs> Spoken like a true scientist, right? Is that, can we do the inverse problem? Can you look at the rainbow and back out the... You, you probably could, actually. You could back out some information from those structures about the size distribution. Okay, so everything we've just said ignores one detail, which is we have to now put these pieces together. We have to put the pieces of the, the color. So we know that the colors of the rainbow are just white light broken into its constituents, just, you know, the Isaac Newton kind of experiment except for we're doing it with water drops instead of prisms. And, but previously we talked about how atmospheric scattering can take out the short wave light and leave the long wave light if you're looking at the sunset or sunrise. And the same thing holds if we look at a rainbow very, very late in the evening or possibly early in the morning. Where I live, we don't see rainbows early in the morning. We usually see them late in the evening. And so this is looking east, and here's a rainbow piece. Can you see that there? And how many colors are in that rainbow? Mostly just one, right? There's pretty much just red, and maybe a little bit of yellow. And that's because all the shorter wavelength colors have been scattered out. They've been removed to create the blue sky over there in the west for somebody else. And so this is with the sun sitting right on the horizon. And that's why this is coming down at about a 90 degree angle, if you imagined a flat plane here. So this is a very late afternoon sun, or a sunset rainbow, and it's very red because of that. And of course, it's surrounded by red clouds because there's only red light remaining to illuminate the clouds. Very beautiful scene mm -hmm. that was surprisingly difficult to take that picture because it was quite dark. The sky was quite dark at this point. Okay, now I want to go the other direction and say, okay, well, if there's a red rainbow and you can isolate that red, what, what about if we push into the near infrared? Um, some of you know a colleague of ours named Bob Greenler, and he wrote a paper back in the 1970s and showed some very interesting photographs of the infrared rainbow using infrared film. But nowadays, it's so much simpler. We don't have to go running to the refrigerator and get infrared film and load the camera. Now I can just take a picture with my digital camera. If you, if you have your digital camera modified to remove the filter that I mentioned earlier that blocks the near infrared, otherwise your camera would respond very, very strongly to the near infrared. So, so they all have filters that block that. If you took that filter off, you would see the infrared rainbow very easily. And you would see it simultaneous with the visible rainbow. But what, what you don't have to do that. You don't have to ruin your camera. You can just, you have enough residual sensitivity that if you put your camera on a tripod and put a filter on your camera that blocks the visible radiation and passes the longer wavelength, then you can get an image, but it just takes a longer exposure because the sensitivity is way down. The, the amount of transmitted light is way down. So look closely here. And what I did is I put my camera on a tripod and I took a picture of this rainbow, and then I put the filter over the camera lens and took a picture, and I did that several times, and I tried not to move anything. And this, pa this pair worked. So there's the visible rainbow, and there's the infrared rainbow with the infrared filter. Now I'll toggle back and forth a couple times. Look sort of right in here, and try to look at that location, and you'll see that where should the colors be? Well, blue is on the inside for the primary rainbow. Red is on the outside, so near infrared should be slightly even further. And so if you put up your thumb or something and mar mark that location, you'll see that, whoops. Move to the right. 
Yeah, so it shrunk in radius slightly, right? Can you see that? You guys can make that out? So that was kind of fun. And of course, what I would do if I wanted to be help you out a little bit is I'd go into Photoshop and overlay these somehow. But I haven't bothered doing that yet. So, so thank you for just looking at it with me. Yeah, sure. So here's the visible. And so notice that I'll try to put my beam right there. Well, it's, it's hard to hold it. <laughs> but yeah, if you look at it, use the tree as a marker. You'll see, darn it. You'll see that it moves outside of the tree slightly, and then inside of the tree, outside, inside. Can you see it dancing? Right in here is a perfect place to look. Well, if I would hit the right button. It d bounces back and forth. So that's the infrared rainbow. And there is a chase on right now to see ultraviolet rainbows, but I don't have pictures of that right now. The other thing that you might notice is that these uh, trees are very bright in the near infrared. And that's because if some of you were at my talk yesterday, I showed a slide where I talked about that, in fact, that, that affects what you see in polarization in the sky. Because, because of chlorophyll absorption, the plants reflect very small amounts of light in the visible. But then right at, there's an edge called the red edge. Right at 700 nanometers, the reflectivity jumps from 2 or 3% up to something that can be as high as 50, 60, 70%. So vegetation looks, healthy vegetation looks very, very bright in the near infrared. So it looks like a snow covered scene when it's not. OK. So now let's go to cloud droplets. So previously, we were looking at raindrops. And now we are going to look at cloud drops. So this is much smaller particles. It's still me scattering because it's still larger than the wavelength, but it's smaller than a cloud droplet. And so, or, sorry, I said that wrong. The, it's smaller than the raindrop. So we have a big raindrop, and now we have a medium-sized cloud droplet. And this is still large enough to require me scattering, but small enough to be different. And what do we see? What's that? Oh, I was estimating it as being one uh, millimeter diameter. Of course, raindrops have a wide range of sizes. And because of that, you see a very wide ranging variety of rainbows. Some rainbows will be very vivid colors and very sharp. Some rainbows will be very almost pastel colors. And it, it, a lot of that has to do with the size of the raindrops. OK, so now let's go to cloud droplets. If you, if you create a rainbow in a cloud instead of in a raindrop, so now I'm representing the cloud as being 10 micron radius uh, droplets. And of course, clouds can have a wide range of droplet sizes too. But this is a typical <laughs> cloud droplet size. So if, if we have spherical droplets of radius 10 micron, and we run a me scattering calculation, we see the corona, which is going to be something that we'll see around the sun. We see the glory, which is something around the opposite point of the sun. And we see something here that looks like a rainbow, but it doesn't quite look the same. But it's, <coughs> it's called a cloud bow. And of course, what I need to do is run this calculation and show you multiple curves for all the different wavelengths, because this is a calculation for a specific wavelength. And if I did that, you would see that, aha, what's happening here now is I have small enough droplets that the colors are being spread out, and they're overlapping. So we lose our color. Uh, sensitivity entirely. And this rainbow, we expect to just look like a white bow. And sure enough, here's what it is. This is a cloud bow photographed from an airplane. The sun is behind me. And the anti-solar point, the point opposite of the sun, is right here. You can see a little shadow of the airplane. You can also see a little colored ring. That's the glory. Th those are the glory rings. And I'm taking this with a fairly wide angle lens out, out the window of the airplane. And you can see that where this band is here. Can you all make that out? There's, uh, in fact, there's, there's even some structure down here that, that arises when you're inside the cloud sometimes. So there's a cloud bow. Um, when I first started shooting pictures of cloud bows, I, it's, it's like everything else, right? When you've never seen one, you don't know they're there. Once you've seen one, you start seeing them everywhere. And so now, almost every time I'm in an airplane, I see a cloud. Not every time, but you know, every third or fourth trip, I see a cloud bow. And I'm like, wow, they're all over the place. 
And some of these pictures are just really fun. I'm always sitting there taking pictures of cloud bows, and other people are reading their books and looking at me, wondering what I'm doing. Please make your remark about the image. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so the question has to do with the amount of detail that you see. If, you're, if your eyes are good, or if you're standing up here like I am, you can see the actual airplane inside of that circle. You can see there's wings. You can see the shape. Um, you may not be able to resolve any detail finer than that, but you can certainly resolve the fact that there's an airplane there. And generally speaking, and I'll show you this in a few minutes, when we're closer to the cloud, you see that geometric detail much more clearly and much, more, much larger. His question has to do with why we see so much detail, even though we're fairly far away. And I don't have a complete answer to that, but part of the answer is I may not be as high as you think I am here, because we're just climbing out of the clouds. And, but it's at great altitudes. Yeah. I've also seen a lot of variety, and I don't have a complete answer for that. It's very interesting. Um, that is in the cloud. The, the question was whether the shadow was in the cloud or on the ground. That is on the cloud. You see that scattered back in the cloud. And I'm sure it has something to do with the structure and the drop size distribution. There's an interesting paper that I was part of a, f a number of years back where we had a camera. There was a radar experiment where we were flying a radar over the ocean. And we also had a camera looking down. And we realized that we had these really beautiful images of the airplane reflected in the ocean surface. And in fact, Yoav, I thought of this when I was talking to your student, Marina, about the surface wave structure. Because what we were doing is we were looking at distorted images of the airplane and talking about how that relates to the wave structure that we were measuring with the radar. <coughs> and so I guess we could actually use that airplane to back out the wave structure, but we didn't do that. So here's a cloud bow that I saw in a very interesting setting that combines multiple things that we've talked about. This is down at Yellowstone Park. So here's one of the hot pools. So if you fell in that water, you would boil your skin off. And so don't do that. This is moonlight. And so you can see this is the Milky Way up here. And there's stars. And this is steam. This white stuff down here is all steam rising from this geyser. Or it's actually not a geyser in this case. It's just a, just a hot pot. So this thermal pool has steam rising from it. And the moon is behind me, as you can see by my shadow. Here's me. Here's my camera. And I'm taking this long time exposure, and you can see this cloud bow wrapping around. You can also tell that it's in a very wide angle picture because the, the bow is a very large thing to begin with. And you see a much larger thing than the bow. This is taken with my fisheye lens that has 180 degree field of view from that corner to that corner. So there's a nice, there's a nice cloud bow. So the question is, how come my shadow is so stable? It's because I wanted to be in my picture, so I held still. <laughs> so I just stayed still for, you know, it's, it's not that long of an exposure. It might be 20 seconds or 15 or maybe even only 10 seconds. I don't remember. OK, so here's our polarization story that we were talking about. If you, if you look at that reflection off of the back surface of the water drop, it's, it's near, near enough to the Brewster angle that the light is 90 so something percent polarized. And so if you put a polarizer with its transmission axis just off of vertical here, we can maximize the intensity of that rainbow, whereas we can rotate it and be just off of horizontal. And we, this is the same rainbow, but we, we don't see it. You actually can see it a little bit there. There's a little bit of residual rainbow. Um, a number of years ago, I was reading a phot photography magazine. And a very, very famous outdoor photographer 
wrote something about that you should always photograph rainbows with a polarizing filter because it makes them look so much more beautiful. And I almost wrote a letter back to him saying, well, not really. I mean, it's only true if you're shooting a picture like this, right, of a piece of a rainbow. Because you, if you pick any angle and you take a wide angle picture, any polarizer setting will enhance part of the rainbow and kill part of the rainbow. So if I had a wide angle picture here, we would see this rainbow here, and then the top of the rainbow, which is polarized horizontally, would be extinguished. So I didn't bother explaining optics to him about that. But he's a very famous guy, so I didn't want to bother him. OK, so let's go to the angle right around the sun or the moon, because it doesn't matter if this is a sun or a moon or a street light or whatever. Any light source, if we have water droplets, in this case in the clouds, if we have those water droplets between the light source and us, then we can look at the forward scattered diffracted light. And that's exactly what this is. is this is usually described as being diffraction, because scatter, or diffraction is just scattering in the near forward direction. And so because of that, if we had spherical little droplets, we would get circular rings. In this case, you get some structure, and that's because the cloud droplets are not uniform, and the cloud itself is not uniform. And the building here is just being used to block the sun. If you try to take a picture with the sun in the picture, it's very hard to get the exposure right to see the colors. So the best way to see this is when you see the sun behind a thin cloud, to close one eye and then put your thumb up and block the sun, and look at the scattering around the sun, and you'll see quite often. This is a very, very common thing to see. Much more common than people think that it is. It helps also to put on sunglasses. It doesn't matter if they're polarized sunglasses. It just cuts down the glare and helps you, helps you see the colors. And so we can describe it, the diffraction process, with a simple little diagram here. We can say that we have nominally plane wave illumination coming in. We hit a water droplet that's going to be a sphere, because these are usually cloud droplets, so they really are spheres, typically. Here's us being happy little observers on the ground. We have a head, no body. That's all right. And what, what are you going to see? Well, you're going to see what we teach as an airy pattern, right? We're going to see this circular set of rings centered on the light source. So there will be one bright ring, and then there will be a dim ring, and very weak rings on the outside. If you take a cross section of that, it'll look like this. And because of because of the radical difference in intensity of these rings, you can either expose correctly for the center, or you have to overexpose the center and get the outer rings. Typically, that's what we do, because we're trying to see those colors on the outside. Yeah, we know the formula for the angle. And so you can actually do this. And so somebody was asking about inverting back. I and others have done this, where you actually take pictures of corona. And you can back out what the size of the droplets are in the cloud just by looking at the size of the, of the diffraction rings. But now if we put many water droplets, if they're all the same size, we know that we get the same airy pattern. And so that's no problem. But if they become different sizes, then, this, then the location of the zeros in the diffraction pattern move for each different size of droplet. And that will wash out the colored pattern that you see. So the two things that you need to see a really pretty corona are droplet sizes that are nearly uniform, and also some cloud that's not very optically thick. Because if it's optically thick, then the multiple scattering will kill, off, kill it off. <coughs> this is a very closely related phenomenon. This is called iridescence. And this is just larger angle scattering. Um, you can think of this as being every point in this cloud has a very narrow drop size distribution, but it's spatially non-uniform. So the mean drop size here is different from the mean drop size here, which is different from the mean drop size here. So we get all these very beautiful pastel colors. Go ahead, you had a question. Um, well, we have an unpolarized source, typically, and so, so we don't typically see a polarization effect there. Um, 
If I looked at a corona with a polarization filter, um, I don't think I would see anything special. Do I have that backwards? No, I, I haven't seen anything. This was actually on Christmas Day one year. I had lots of family members in my house, so I walked outside to escape for a minute and breathe some fresh air because lots of family members in a small house can get interesting at times. And I looked up and I saw this beautiful uh, iridescent cloud, so I went and grabbed my camera and took this picture. Prelude to Santa Claus, right? That's right. <laughs> Prelude to Santa Claus. OK, so now we'll go to the other side of the plot, where we, instead of over here looking toward the sun, now we look at the antisolar point, and we predict, with me scattering, that there's some ripples there that could be wavelength dependent, so they could be colored rings. And sure enough, this is a picture of the valley where I live, and the mountains where I like to ski. and. The whole valley was filled with clouds that morning, and the airplane, it was a very gray, dark morning. And the airplane took off and broke through the clouds, and it was this beautiful scene. And I got this nice glory, and so I took that picture. And here, you don't see any real hint of the, of the shadow of my airplane. But here's some other pictures with different clouds on a different day, where you do see the glory rings with a shadow of the airplane. As we get closer to the clouds, so either you're rising out of the clouds on takeoff or coming down, descending into the clouds on landing, you can also tell exactly where the photographer is seated because it's always, th these rings are centered around my head, the shadow of my head. And so you can tell in this case, I was sitting right about here. Yeah, near the toilets. Thank you for that. <laughs> OK, here I'm f sitting in first class, so there. <laughs> Some days you get upgraded. And the interesting thing here is that you get multiple copies of the wing. And sometimes these pictures can look very, very interesting. And I, I haven't thought about this deeply enough to have a complete answer, but I'm quite certain that what it is is during the integration time of the picture, you're, you know, you're flying very fast. And so the clouds are changing. And so I think you're actually seeing reflections from different parts of the cloud. In other words, there's, if you imagine this in three dimensions, there's part of the cloud that's closer to me and part of the cloud that's further away. And the shadow will be different at those different levels. So I think that's what we're seeing here. And nowadays, it's much better because, you know, for a while there, people were convinced that cameras were going to crash airplanes. And so the flight attendants would get very angry with me if I took pictures when we were landing, which is, that's when all the good stuff happens. And so now they say, oh, that's just fine. You can use your camera. So I'm happy. OK, so let's talk a little bit about ice optics. Everything we've looked at so far is scattering or refraction in nominally spherical droplets. So now let's relax that and talk about uh, optical effects in ice. And ice is typically, in the atmosphere, hexagonally shaped. And it can be a plate like this, or it can be a long hexagonally cross-section column. And the minimum deviation angle here is approximately 22 degrees for ice, given the, given the liquid or the uh, index of refraction of ice. And so if sunlight comes in on one face, it'll be refracted, refracted again, and this net angle will be approximately 22 degrees. And this will be very similar are identical to what you would see with an, uh, with an appropriate prism in your laboratory. If those plates, it, so if we have hexagonal plates and they're sitting with horizontal orientation, maybe with a slight bit of rocking around, then we will get a spot of light at 22 degrees on either side of the sun. And that's here and here. And we see that. You can also make out some rest of the halo, right? There's little bits and pieces of the halo. That's because there's randomization of the, of the angles, the orientation of the crystals. But they're not very random. They're mostly horizontal. And so in this case, the brightest feature that we see is, is the sun dog, as it's commonly called, parhelia, as it's scientifically known. 
Yeah, so you have a you have a hexagonal plate, and they're they're floating in the air. So the the aerodynamic forces would would cause them to be flat, with their long axis horizontal. If there's a lot of turbulence in the air, a lot of updraft, for example, then they can get turning around. And so in very calm air, you'll see this kind of effect. In more turbulent air, you'll see, with more of an updraft, you'll see this kind of effect where the the uh, they are either randomly aligned or poorly aligned crystals. Then, then you get this 22 degree spot of light at different angles of azimuth, and so you can get a full, a full halo. Now, the ironic thing about halos is that you don't have to be in a cold weather place, even though you think, well, this is ice. Right here in Israel, you get ice. It's just called cirrus clouds. This is in Tucson, Arizona. Trust me, Tucson, Arizona is not cold. <laughs> it's, that's where I did my PhD, and, and it's not like Alaska. These are cirrus clouds, and so even though it might be you know, 35, 40 degrees Celsius at the ground, up high at the altitude of the cloud, maybe 10 or 12 kilometers, it's minus 40 C or colder. And so you have ice, for sure, up there. And those ice crystals are creating this halo. So, this was actually in one of the optics and photonics news calendars a couple years back because I think they liked the, the sort of irony of having a palm tree and ice optics. Here's some more ice optics. This was taken just a couple weeks ago, actually. I took this picture near my house. And we had, we had sort of three or four days when we had really cold air come down out of Alaska. And it became very cold. And I always get very happy when it's cold because then there's good optics. And everybody else is miserable. But you can see the houses are all struggling to stay warm. The sun is setting behind the mountains. And there's this pillar of light. This is a very similar thing to what you see probably very commonly on the ocean. This is a picture that I took. This is similar to the picture I took while I was landing in Tel Aviv just two days ago. But this is a picture I actually took landing in San Diego a couple years ago. And you can see the sun is up here. And it's reflecting off of the ocean. If the ocean was perfectly flat, completely flat plane of water, you would get one spot, a specular reflection. And that would be at the specular point, maybe here. If instead the ocean has some little ripples on it, or some wave structure, then <coughs> you get flat plates that you can think about it as flat facets that have some slope of angles. And those angles will spread out the single specular point into a streak that we call a glitter path or a glitter pattern. And a very famous study done in the 1950s was some guys flew around in an old World War II bomber and took pictures of glitter patterns around the islands of Hawaii. and determined a relationship, because they had ships down on, on the surface, they determined a relationship between the, you can geometrically derive what the roughness of the surface is for this pat, from these images. And then they were relating it to wind speed at a certain height above the water. And so this, this relationship I noticed some people here were using. And it's very famous. It's called the Cox-Monk relationship. Then years later, I came along and used a laser instrument to create laser glitter patterns and repeated their study and actually did some modifications to the Cox Monk model. And so we, we used optics. We used nature to help us learn how to design instruments to study nature, which is nice. But this is the same idea. It's just these are now little flat plates of ice in the atmosphere that have slightly or some small range of tilt angles. And the, the more the light the more the plates are tilting, the taller this pillar becomes. And so you can tell that it's tilting a fair bit here, but they're still very stable. Then a few minutes later, it developed this structure. So now here's this light pillar, and you get this thing that is called an upper tangent arc. And it's interesting that we don't see any of the rest of the halo. It's just an upper tangent arc separated from the halo. Normally, the halo would go right through that point. But we don't see the halo. We just see the upper tangent arc. So it was a really beautiful display. And again, just a couple weeks ago. 
Okay, let me talk for a few minutes about, let's go from ice to super ice. Let's go way, way high in the atmosphere. This is, we're going to talk about up at around 80 kilometers, where the aurora is up here at around 100 kilometers. Noctilucent clouds is what we want to talk about next at around 80 kilometers. All of clouds and everything else we've talked about is down here, 10 kilometers and below nominally. So these are clouds that are so high that they're illuminated and become visible. They're very optically thin, so you, they're very, you cannot see them in the daytime. But because the scattered light from the at lower atmosphere dominates. But when these lower atmosphere clouds are in shadow, then you can get these high altitude clouds illuminated and they glow. So you can sit there and watch at sunset. You can watch the sky get darker and darker and darker. Then all of a sudden, literally out of the black, boom, these clouds light up. And it's very, very beautiful and spooky to see. You can also see the inverse. You can watch during sunrise. Long before sunrise, you can watch, maybe an hour before sunrise, you can see these clouds get lit up. This is, to the first order, this is a high latitude effect. So you can only see these at high latitudes. Uh, they're starting to be more and more visible at lower latitudes. And I captured this really pretty remarkable image of noctilucent clouds at Bozeman, where I live, which is 45, just, just over 45 degrees latitude. So that's mid-latitudes by definition. And it was just the, the sky was black, and then it turned into this band of white, bluish white clouds. Very, very beautiful effect. So again, very high altitude clouds. This is a picture of a display of noctilucent clouds that we saw in Alaska this summer. Yoav was there, Steve Lipson was there, and I don't know if either or both of you saw this display that night, but, but here's the Geophysical Institute where our conference was being held. And, and in this case, from where I lived, when I saw noctilucent clouds, they were just right down on the horizon. But here, this is 65 degrees north latitude, so they were covering almost the entire sky. It was really remarkable. And you might not realize how remarkable it looks because you look at the picture and it looks so similar to daytime cirrus clouds. <coughs> These are not daytime and they're not cirrus clouds. <coughs> and so the, I think the remarkable thing about it is the contrast between what you saw a minute ago and what you see now. The sky is just black and then all of a sudden you look up and it's turned silvery white. It's really very, can be very remarkable. And as long as we're talking about the high latitudes, we'll talk a little bit about the aurora. Charged particles coming in from the sun will get captured by the magnetic field of the Earth and get sucked down to where they collide with molecules and atoms in the atmosphere of the Earth and release light in the process. And the lights that we call the aurora will have most characteristically this kind of green color. This is an oxygen. Uh, release at 557.7 nanometers. This is a picture that I took in Alaska. This is one of my students taking some measurements. And being, being a chicken, because he's inside the dome staying warm. And I'm outside where the wind is howling and it's cold. But you don't get good pictures from inside. You get good pictures from outside. So. Sometimes you get very strong red colors in the aurora. And these are dynamic, of course. Remember that especially in a place like Alaska, when you see this aurora, this is not a static scene. These are moving. Now, the problem I have is that it's becoming very common to see on the internet time-lapse movies of the aurora. And that's great. But what the, what the photographers should tell you in big, bold letters is what the speed was so that you can try to think about what reality looks like. The, I think a lot of people think now that the aurora moves very rapidly. It generally does not. It, it moves at speeds kind of like this t on a typical night. You might have a curtain that moves back and forth sort of like this. Now, on some other nights, you'll see a, a little feature that's moving along. All of a sudden, it'll move really fast. But this stuff that you see on the internet of the sky just dancing like this over and over again, that's, that's, uh, that's sped up a factor of you know, 100 or something. So it's, it's neat. I like it, but I wish they would tell the truth about what they're doing. Uh, this, is, this is one type of red. You can see the green down here. 
and then this is nitrogen red. This is oxygen, and this is nitrogen. Can you see the difference? This is a very pure, deep red. This is a, almost a purplish color. And the reason is, if you look at the spectrum of the auroral emission lines, the nitrogen gas is giving off a combination of red and blue. And we see that combination of red and blue as purple. So when you see a purplish blue, or sorry, a purplish red color, you can think that you're almost for sure seeing nitrogen. Whereas when you see this pure red, especially when it's on the top of the display, it's almost certainly oxygen. These pictures, remarkably enough, were taken at my house in Bozeman, Montana. So again, 45 degrees north latitude. This is, this is an unusual thing to see a display that good that far south. But it's not as unusual as people think. In Montana, we get decent aurora several times a year, and people just don't know when to look. And so I just pay attention, and I, I get a lot of pictures. Why do you see oxygen at all? It's because the density is very different when you're up in the very, very upper reaches of the atmosphere. We have, it, it has to do with the uh, excitation times. So the oxygen, the oxygen will just get quenched by the nitrogen if you have a high density, so that if you increase the probability of a collision, so if you reduce the, the time between collisions. So yeah, so the question is, is there any chance of seeing aurora here? Right now we're in Israel at about 33 degrees north latitude. I would say yes, but very rare. But I have seen cases where the aurora is visible as far south as this. But it's only going to be once in a very great while. And usually it's something that looks like this. So the good news is, if you ever saw it here, it would probably look like this. Because the most intense displays tend to be this red color. And those are the displays that tend to push farthest south. So I've seen, if you go search on the internet, you can see pictures of red aurora from Arizona, for example, and Florida, both places that are about this far south. So it can be done, but it's very, very rare. And then I think my last picture that I'm going to show you is this is another aurora in Montana. This was on my birthday last year. And you can see this very, very beautiful purple color, which is a combination of red and blue emission. This was barely visible by eye, but my camera could pull the colors out and really enhance them nicely. But I could see it by eye, but it wasn't quite that obvious. Oh, I guess this is the last one that I wanted to show you. This is coming home from Alaska from that meeting in the summer. After we saw the beautiful noctilucent clouds, everybody else on the airplane was asleep. And I was awake, and I had an upgraded seat in first class, and I had my tripod with me. And I was sitting there taking pictures out the airplane window. Even still, it's very difficult, because there's not much room in an airplane seat. So I'm very proud of this picture. This is actually in the Optics and Photonics News calendar this this year, I think. So this is, a, this is Aurora seen over central Canada on the way back home from Alaska. And with that, I will encourage you to keep looking around you and enjoy all the optical things that we can see. Thank you. So I know it's getting a little bit late. And if, you're, uh, if you need to go, go. If you have questions, though, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, yes. I, I wish I would have thrown in a picture of green flash. I'll look. I probably have one here. Um, it is real, and you can see it. And this wouldn't be a bad place to look for it as the sun sets down over the water. And what, what's happening is dispersion in the atmosphere is spreading apart the colors of the sun. And so the last color you should see is blue or violet. But all those shorter wavelengths get scattered out. So the last color you really see is green. So when the right, just a momentary glimpse right before the sun dips below the horizon, the last piece you should see is green. So that would mean a clear sky without the clouds, maybe? Yeah, you need, to, you need to have no clouds between you and the setting sun. It can be below clouds. That's OK. 
But, but yeah, the clouds. Yeah, you you should be able to see it from the from the mountains looking down at the sun setting. Even from the beach, I know in places like Hawaii, there's lots of little uh, cafes down by the beach called the Green Flash Cafe. There's a really famous one down in Tahiti or somewhere, the Green Flash Cafe. It's and the sun when yeah, it's a symmetric property, so you could see it right before the sun rises. I actually saw it once on the road driving up to Mauna Loa Observatory on the island of Hawaii. And, and I could see the sun was rising. I could tell that the sun was almost to the horizon. So I stopped the car, got out, and looked. And I saw it. Sure enough, there was a green flash. So then I drove really fast up the road again to get another sunrise, and, or down the road, or whatever I did. And the, uh, I don't think it worked. I didn't see a, didn't see a second one. So I was trying to cheat nature and get two, but I didn't. But it's elusive. It's hard to see unless you're just in the right conditions. On Haifa Beach, six times. Good. Yeah, yeah. If you if you look at even just the geometric optics of where the rays bounce, you can you can track where all those rainbows are. Yeah, they're on the side of the sun, so they're very difficult to see. They have been seen, and at our uh, Yoav and I both have participated, and Steve Lipson is. So we we've all been part of this meeting, and 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 you know about that the. Uh, uh, Applied Optics Journal published a paper, I can't remember, just a couple years ago. I was the editor on this special issue for this group that meets every couple years and discusses light and color in nature. And we, at that meeting, we had sort of a challenge laid down by one of the scientists who attends. And he, sh he, he did a very careful simulation study of what the conditions are that you could see a higher order rainbow or maybe see it. And so he threw down the gauntlet, and a couple of German observers went home from that meeting and went out and took some pictures and then used Photoshop to enhance them and showed that you, they could see it. So then they published this paper showing the first ever pictures of the fifth order. And then some other people came along and showed third and fourth. And so at, the, at our recent meeting, that was a big topic of discussion, was these pictures of high order rainbows. But all of them are Photoshop treated pictures. In other words, you couldn't just look at the scene and see those rainbows with your eye because of contrast. It's a contrast problem. And so, you know, is that fair? We had a big debate about whether that really constitutes an observation or not. Well, of course it's an observation, but, but it's a Photoshop treated observation. So yeah, unfortunately, we don't usually get to see those higher order rainbows by eye, but but they are there, and they are being seen and photographed. And now that people know where to look and how to do it, I think you will start seeing more and more photos showing these higher order rainbows. But the difficult ones are when you're looking back toward the sun. Go ahead. For what? The oh, so you're saying like, what if we had a plume of smoke or something? Yeah, so the question I think, I'll try to recast your question, is could we have a thin plume of smoke or something that would cause the sun to look red? Or do we need a long path? It, it's all about the net. Uh, optical effect. It's all about the net extinction and net scattering. And so if you have a fairly dense plume, then you, d you only need a short path through it. If you, need, if you have the atmosphere by itself, then you need a longer path because the density is lower, uh, the density of the scattering particles. So really, it's the scattering optical depth that we need to be talking about here. Yeah, so, and I've seen that many times. I've seen a fairly, 
you know, geometrically thin plume of forest fire smoke come out of the mountains around my home and blow across the sun, and then you get a very, very deep red sunset. Even though it's geometrically thin, it's optically quite thick. So yeah, you definitely can get that kind of effect. Good question. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you. And <laughs> let me see if I have a green flash picture for anybody that wants to see it. I don't know. <laughs>